Hello and welcome to the Debating Toastcast, a podcast about all things debating, from the Debate Toastmasters Club 104 London Debaters. Hi, in this episode of the Debating Toastcast, we are going to listen to some arguments put forward in a monologue by the brilliant podcaster Alex O'Connor, which he recorded a couple of weeks after the death of Queen Elizabeth II, in which he makes the case for the abolition of the British monarchy. Now, I've listened to this monologue very carefully several times, and what I'm going to do in this episode is to take the main arguments and supporting premises that Alex is putting forward and construct an oppositional case by trying to rebut his arguments and pointing out fallacies, etc. This is not to say that one of four London debaters take any particular stance on the question of monarchy one way or the other. Uh, rather, the pur- purpose of this podcast is merely to learn something from, in this instance, uh, the process of rebutting an argument. The whole monologue is about a quarter of an hour, so for the sake of time I have cut some of the things Alex says uh, and I've tried to focus on the main arguments. But if you wish to hear the whole monologue, the link will be provided somewhere in the comments below. So let's start by listening to the opening of Alex O'Connor's monologue. Like most of the country, these past two weeks, my thoughts have been with the Queen. But also, like most of the country, this has been through no choice of my own, and instead the result of an impressively unrelenting torrent of news coverage, business disruptions, and obsessive displays of performative grief on a scale that would put even the most ambitious propagandist to shame. You currently can't walk for two minutes anywhere in central London without being met with some morbid black and white depiction of Her Majesty's face. And if you've turned on any British news channel recently, You'll have seen a thin, delicate strip of text informing you of Russia's alleged war crimes against Ukraine, the murder of an Iranian woman for refusing to cover her hair, or the search for missing people in Italian floods, with these stories being relegated to the bottom of the screen to make room for the main feature, rolling coverage of William and Charles shaking hands with members of the public. Prince William, greasing people... Having lots of chats with people, conversations, asking them about how long they've been queuing, what kind of footwear they're wearing. So he opens uh, his uh, monologue with criticism of the news coverage of the death of the late Queen. You may or may not agree with them, of course, that the news coverage was excessive, uh, but whether it was or not is not in and of itself an argument against the monarchy. He says he's been thinking of the Queen through no choice of his own. Well, I remember back in 2012, during the Olympics, I had to think of that through no choice of my own. It's simply the case that when you live in a society with other people, and especially when something that a lot of people think very, very important for pretty obvious reasons, then, well, you are going to have to think about it and respond to it, even if you don't personally take a strong interest. But I want to, in particular, point out a a little fallacy here in this a bit. And that's where Alex O'Connor shows an example of the coverage uh, with a where he's picked out a particularly inane, uh, almost comically inane comment made by the newsreader. And the problem is that he then he only shows that one example. Now, in debating, we call this fallacy uh, the fallacy of cherry picking your example, meaning that you choose an example that is particularly favorable to illustrate your conclusion, even if it is not particularly representative. Okay, next bit. Too soon? It's been suggested by a noble few that it may be something of a cheap tactic to choose now of all times to criticise the monarchy, and that I should wait until later out of respect for the Queen and her family. Well, for what it's worth, I did wait. The Queen died more than two weeks ago now, and I even waited until after the funeral. And so I would only ask, how long would you have me wait? So here, um, I will just quickly comment that uh, this is a bit of a what we call a red herring. Uh, it's a completely irrelevant point. Um, nothing to do with the monarchy as such, um, but about to do with how long he feels he needs to wait so as not to be criticised by other people. But the fact is, of course, that you know he asks uh, in in this rather melodramatic way, "How long would you have me wait?" But who is he asking this to? I mean. Um, he's free to make whatever criticism he wants at any point, 
It's uh, there's there's no, no real hindrances to that, uh, either before, during, or after the uh, the period of mourning of Queen Elizabeth II in particular. Um, so just uh, again a very irrational, um, not irrational, but irrelevant point um, that is designed to make you sort of feel sympathy with with him and how terribly difficult it is for him to make a criticism of the monarchy. Um, we can see the evidence of this, of course, in the incessant referral to members of the House of Windsor as highness and majesty, and not just by adorning sycophants either, but by news broadcasters, the papers, and even leaders of foreign states. Think about that phrase for a moment, your royal highness. It's worth remembering that highness is a relative term. Higher than what, exactly? Who is it that these fellow homo sapiens deem themselves to be higher than, and on what grounds? Usage of this excruciating label is at once a reminder and reinforcement of our position not as citizens, but as subjects, and subjects of a monarch whose political status has been inherited by virtue of mere bloodline. This is what I'm being asked to respect, and I find myself simply incapable of such a thing. But I so here, Alex is making the claim that by using title titles such as uh, your highness uh, we are implying that these royals are higher in terms of their personal qualities perhaps that uh, and that the rest of us are lonesses well quite frankly this is a nonsense and it is um, actually the fallacy of an appeal to emotion in this case perhaps the emotions of indignation or jealousy you know how dare they call me a loners of course, they're not doing anything of the kind. The title, Your Highness, and you ask by, by sort of what right, uh, uh, etc., they, they claim to have this title. Well, it is the dignity and the importance of the office that they have been uh, given. And it is not the Homo sapien holding that office that has that importance and that highness. It is the office itself. So it doesn't make any of us lower. It simply reminds us that the holders of such high offices uh, that they need to live up to the high expectations that the dignity and importance of that office places upon them. But I understand, of course, why they keep up with this language. It's clear to me that the linguistic submission in using terms like majesty and highness are as essential to the continuation of the monarchy as are the crowns and the capes. Why? Because if you were to remove these things, what would this family be left with? Without the deference, without the jewels, without the ceremony, who are these people? The monarchy, especially that lukewarm and impotent form of British monarchy that doesn't anymore possess any real political power to speak of, appears to me nothing more than thinly disguised celebrity. An obsession over celebrities is tiresome enough when it isn't being funded by the taxpayer. A moment's reflection reveals that their highness is our lowness. And so when a news broadcaster refers to His Royal Highness King Charles III, they're not just asserting their own position as a subordinate, which they're welcome to do if they wish, but also mine, and yours, and subordinate to a controversial hereditary dynasty whose right to rule is still, I'll remind you, officially legitimized by the authority of a god that doesn't exist. How is this not more controversial? Our only lawful and rightful liege lord, Charles III. So there's a couple of important factual errors here. Um, Alex keeps referring to the mere bloodline, that the monarch has the right to rule over us by mere bloodline. But um, first of all, it should be pointed out that in a constitutional monarchy such as the British one, and in particular the British one for a very particular reason that I'm I'm going to explain, mere bloodline is not enough to claim uh, the right to the throne. So oh, I'll, I'll explain that now by reference to, to something that happened in history, and that was back in 1685, when King Charles II died. So now we have the third, but that was uh, uh, Charles II. And his brother James took the crown by bloodline. But due to a number of factors to do with James's uh, uh, sort of inclination towards Catholicism, his bad political judgment, and the fact that he eventually got a son who, by mere bloodline, would become the next king. But a Catholic one, it was feared. The people and parliament could no longer accept him as king. So he was essentially deposed. 
and William of Orange, a Dutchman who was married to James's daughter Mary, and importantly, who were both Protestants, uh, uh, were then invited to, to come over and become king and queen. So, you know, immigrants coming over, taking our jobs, nothing new there. They even came by boat. Um, now the so that's so mayor bloodline no that's after that the, what became known as the glorious revolution of 1689 the hereditary principle is only one of several criteria now the second important uh, sort of factual fallacy uh, that alex sort of mentions here is that oh the queen ruled over us and uh here i really need to just quote you a very short passage from this uh, book the british constitution made simple rather a misleading title i have to say by uh, by Colin Padfield, the the barrister, and he explains in it that the Queen, by convention, um, I quote, the Queen by convention always acts on the advice of her ministers and never vetoes a statute enacted by Parliament. As we have observed, the Queen reigns but does not rule. Now, this is not a mere technicality about um, you know ling word, linguistics and the use of word. It is actually a fundamental principle in the constitutional British monarchy, and I think. One that you ought to be aware of if you are going to put forward a serious criticism of the British monarchy. Finally, he also, uh, I think, commits a bit of a strawman fallacy or when he uh, says that, uh, oh, you know, uh, they this is this this monarchy is uh, justified with reference to God. So then the, my question is, well, who is justifying it with reference to God? And then he, he plays a clip of a man reading a traditional text that we have inherited from history. Uh, you know, the fact is that, yes, we, we do refer to the word God, but that's not the basis for justification. And I think Alex knows that very well, but it's very easy to use that to say that because it sort of makes it easier for those listening to agree with him because, oh, that's a bit weird in a modern, you know, secular society to, to refer to God. Yeah, but the fact is nobody is doing that and in earnest believing that that is the justification. That's it's, That's just traditions that we read uh, these texts that are many, many decades, sometimes centuries old and very beautiful. And they are part of our tradition and they're part of the, the, the sort of ceremonies that we that we do. But we don't in earnest justify the institution by reference to God. And I, I should actually mention also something that J.P. Somerville, the, the, the Cambridge, um, Cambridge um, um, historians said in this book, is that actually back in the day when, when these texts were written, any any uh, form of government, whatever the government would, would have been, would have been justified with reference to God, because that, that's just how they did it. And because we use these old texts uh, uh, by way of tradition, uh, that's why the word God appears there. But uh, surely Alex knows that nobody is seriously justifying the institution, uh, you know, on the basis of divine right of kings. Uh, you know, nobody's done that for about 400 years. So you would have to ignore uh, 400 years of history in order to make that uh, uh, come forward with that as a serious argument. It is not a serious argument. It is merely a straw man fallacy. Of course, I'm not this month's only royal critic. You may have seen that some sullen individuals decided to protest the monarchy in person. And what happened? One woman in Scotland was arrested and charged with breach of the peace for simply holding up a sign in Edinburgh reading, fuck imperialism, abolish the monarchy. Arrested and charged. Or consider Simon Hill. Hill attended the proclamation of Charles as king in Oxford, a ceremonial event with no royalty present, and after remaining perfectly silent during the first part of the event concerning the death of the Queen, simply heckled who elected him as Charles was declared the new king. Naturally, he was also arrested. One man in Edinburgh decided to heckle Prince Andrew, former friend and alleged fellow hobbyist of convicted paedophile and sex trafficker Jeffrey Epstein, calling him a sick old man. The protester was dragged away by the police, not before being assaulted twice by members of the public, and has since also been charged with an offence. The men who attacked the protester, of course, were not even questioned. Later, a barrister in London was accosted by the police for, get this, holding up a blank piece of paper in Parliament Square for fear that he might write something offensive on it in the future, like, not my king, which may amount to a crime. Can somebody explain to me why it is that peacefully protesting this decrepit institution must be put on hold 
out of respect for the death of a woman who I really don't wish to insult, but frankly, never met and just don't care that much about. I hope you'll excuse my boldness in refusing to be considered as lesser on account of my bloodline, my hesitation to respect a weeks-long national ceremony predicated on that natural inequality of birth, and my assertion of the right to criticize the monarchy, even at a time when people are sad. The fact that... Okay, so let's, let's try and deal with the substantial point that he makes in this clip, which is a, a criticism of what he sees as the overreaction of law enforcement officers. And he has, in this case, uh, more than one example, I'm glad to say, of these marches of uh, freedom of expression. Well, um, yes, I, I would actually agree with him uh, here. I think they, uh, although they did have a difficult uh, balancing act to try and keep the peace uh, during a time of official national mourning, whilst not suppressing freedom of expression completely, uh, but yeah, I agree. At times they did overreact and they could have just handled it a little bit more um, sort of uh, hands off, I suppose, or if not hands off, then certainly with uh, with uh, kid gloves, I suppose. But what I question here is the relevance of this point. Even if it's true, is it relevant? Has it got anything to do with whether Britain should retain the monarchy or not? Is he making the point... Uh, certainly he doesn't seem to make it explicitly, but is he making the point that the monarchy is by its nature, by the by the fact that we have the monarchy, freedom of expression is being suppressed? Because quite frankly, that's just not the case. We've had freedom of expression before, uh, you know, this particular period of national mourning. And as much as we had it before, we have it now. As a matter of fact, there are many other things I would say today that are far greater threats to freedom of expression things such as cancel culture and um, uh, police reacting to people putting opinions out on social media. For example, we had the case of Harry Miller, who was um, uh, actually called up at work. His employers were in, got involved with it. And when he asked uh, the police, well, why are they calling him about something that isn't illegal? They said that they were recording it as a non-crime hate incident uh, because, you know, he, he had expressed the wrong sort of thinking, which sounds very uh, Orwellian, in my opinion. As a matter of fact, and this is not a, a single incident either, because I shouldn't cherry pick my example. So let me just tell you that in the period 2014 to 19, across 34 of the police forces in England and Wales, 119,934 such non-crime hate incidents were recorded. And the government's own definition of that um, are any utterance subjectively perceived by a person to be motivated wholly or partly by hostility or prejudice. And um, these can actually show up when you uh, apply for a police check well, for certain jobs. You have to have what's known as a DBS check to see if you're suitable for the job. This can come up. You can actually be debarred simply because someone has reported that you fall for uttering an opinion they didn't like, that they thought were prejudicial or something. The fact is that people have been free to criticize the monarchy both before and after Queen Elizabeth's death. So, although, yes, there was a short period with some overreactions, but if Alex is really worried about freedom of speech, monarchy is not actually the problem. It is not causing a general clampdown on freedom of speech in our everyday life year, year in, year out. You don't get cancelled from events and jobs for being a Republican. Uh, so, you know, th this point is basically irrelevant. Bad. The fact that protesters are being arrested, however, shouldn't really come as that much of a surprise, given our monarch's exceptional status within the law of the UK. You might not be aware of the fact that our new king is exempt from a considerable number of laws that the rest of us commoners are bound by. For example, our new king won't be paying a single penny's worth of tax on the £650 million estate he just inherited from his mother. The rest of us have to pay 40% of any inheritance over £325,000 to the government, meaning that because of this immunity, Charles has avoided paying £260 million of inheritance tax. He also isn't liable to pay income tax or capital gains tax. Now, since the 90s, the monarch has paid income tax voluntarily, 
But why on earth is that choice up to them? Perhaps most controversially, the king is also exempt from racial, ethnic, and sexual equality laws, meaning that it is impossible for any of the king's employees to make a complaint to the courts if they experience sexist or racist discrimination. In fact, it's actually impossible to bring any civil or criminal proceedings against the king. Why is the monarch exempt from the law in this way? Now there's a good question. But fear not, because the royal family's official website has the following to say. Although civil and criminal proceedings cannot be taken against the sovereign as a person under UK law, the monarch is careful to ensure that all their activities in a personal capacity are carried out in strict accordance with the law. Well, that- um, I have to say I really appreciated that uh, that sort of uh, posh uh, royal accent uh, Alex put on there. A um, bit of extra colour to the to the debate, I suppose. Well, um, so he makes two points in this uh, section. Uh, first, the tax exemptions and then exemptions from the Equality Act. So let's take tax first. Um, as a matter of fact, it's it's less than 10%. Uh, last time I checked, of all the um, estates in, in, in Britain that come up for inheritance that actually pay any tax at all. So it, it's, a, it's a very small number of all of them. So the fact that you know, there are so many exemptions um, means that, well, why, why shouldn't the king have an exemption uh, in this case? You know, it, he's, he's actually on the side of the majority here. When it comes to income tax, well, you know, the, the income of the king is from the civil list. Uh, he's, he gets paid uh, by parliament. And it's just a nonsense that the, the, the parliament has to, has to then deduct back a portion of that in so-called tax. Because all they have to, do, what that means is basically they have to increase the amount in the first place, in order to then take some back, um, and 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 this is just a, a silliness. You know, the king is is the head of state. He's what he's doing is in the service of the nation. This is to support the operations in the service of the nation, and, and so it's not for his personal benefit anyway. You know, it, it is because of the position of head of state uh, that that those. Um, those particular uh, concessions have been made, and I think they make perfect sense. Uh, they're just sensible uh, arrangements, but they can be taken away. This is a decision made by Parliament, and it's only for as long as Parliament uh, decides that that is the way it should be. It's not. It's not nothing to do with monarchy as such. You know, he they they could take those things away, and it would still be the monarchy would still function perfectly fine. So so again, you know, the 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 weight and on and relevant relevancy of this argument I, I, it's just very very weak and then and same with the second one so the second point was to do with exemptions from the equality act 2010 again there are there are i mean it's true that there are some exemptions but this is also irrelevant there are many exemptions in the uh, equality act 2010 religious orders ministers for example television industry film ad- advertisement industries as well as lavatory attendance. Did you know that? Mm. They have exemptions in the law as well. So I think if loo attendants can have exemptions, so I think can the king. Don't you? I think so. So many others are also given exemptions, and therefore we can have exemptions without the monarchy, and we can have the monarchy without the exemptions. So the point is simply irrelevant. Let's here is next. Some have objected to me that since the monarchy doesn't have any real power to speak of anymore, and is mostly symbolic, it's not really worth all the fuss that I'm making over it. Well, aside from the myriad legal immunities, financial benefits, cultural significance, and one-to-one influence over the prime minister, perhaps this is right. But then in the same breath, I'm told that the monarchy is somehow integral to our political system, and we couldn't hope to abolish it. These two thoughts are difficult to reconcile. If the monarchy does have this power and significance, then it holds both, in my view, illegitimately. And if it doesn't have these, then it becomes a redundant institution and there's not much point in keeping it around. You can't have it both ways. The monarchy can't both be completely powerless and inert, and yet simultaneously integral to the upkeep of our political system. Now, if you... It's a pity that Alex uses less than one minute of his monologue to talk about this point, which... I think perhaps is the most substantial point he brings to his argument, namely, if the argument wields real power, then that's wrong democratically and we should get rid of it. But if it doesn't, um, if it's just an irrelevance, well, then we should also get rid of it. 
And then he presents what in debating is known as the fallacy of the false dichotomy or false choice. He says that you you can't say that the monarchy hasn't got any real power, but at the same time that the institution of monarchy is so integral to the, to the constitution of Britain that we can't easily get rid of it. To which I have to ask, why not? Why can't I say that? In fact, I can. You see, okay, I'm going to get a little bit technical for a moment here. What Alex, I think, is employing here is something Aristotle called an enthymeme. So an enthymeme uh, is an argument, and sorry about the pronunciation for anybody who speaks Greek here. An enthymeme is an argument in which one of the premises are not explicitly stated, one or more. Now, we use this all the time uh, because it's tedious to spell out all the obvious uh, reasons for, for something, you know. Uh, for, for example, if I say, vote for my plan because it, it'll give everybody clean water the cheapest way. What I don't need to spell out is why clean water is better than dirty water, why cheaper is better than more expensive, because that those are obvious points to all. And therefore, they are unstated premises that are part of my argument, but I don't need to state them because they are they are obvious to all. And so if I just make the argument, vote for my plan because you'll get clean water the cheapest way, then that's an empty meme. I, I do give one premise there, but I don't give additional premises to support that because it, 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 those are obvious. Okay, so so that was just to explain an empty meme. It, it, it's, it's something we use all the time, but it's useful to know what we call it in debating. Okay, so what it, what, appear, what it appears to me that Alex is, is, is doing here is arguing with an unstated premise. But actually, in this case, it is one that's not obvious to all. To all. It's one that's actually quite important to spell out and that, that needs to be spelt out, that needs that support of actually saying it out uh, specifically, namely that democracy or the democratic principle must trump everything else in all the sort of contexts of, of governance um, of, of the of the state. Because how else can he claim that our monarchy is illegitimate? So, you know, legitimate is a Latin word originally, and it means lawful or fixed by law in line with the law. And any constitutional monarchy, including ours, is fixed by law. It's subject to law. It's subject to parliament, which is why one historian described Britain as a republic with a king attached. Now, be that as it may, the fact is that our monarchy is literally legitimate because it's fixed according to law. But as Alex is not around here at the moment to uh, to perhaps come back to me and explain what he meant by the word Ill illegitimate, uh, I, I'm going to, well, I think it's reasonable to suppose that what he probably meant was that it's democratically illegitimate because the king has not been voted uh, in, in, you know, in one way or another. Nobody's actually cast a vote for him. But, you know, there's not a, a single country in the world that I know of that is a direct democracy. I, I guess perhaps um, so it's Switzerland comes fairly close with its uh, cantons and its uh, referendums and all sorts of things. But but of all Western countries comparable to Britain, um, what they are, they are ruled by law. So in, in German, we call it a Rechtsstaat. Sorry about the pronunciation there. Uh, with varying degrees of indirect democracy in most cases, uh, based on the principle put forward by you know John Locke in the 17th century and other philosophers and, and theoreticians that a ruler must rule with the consent of the ruled, right? Um, so we don't vote on everything, but we, we give our consent to the system and, and it works. Now, since the glorious revolution of 1689 that I referenced earlier, which made Britain a limited constitutional monarchy, the king or the queen uh, reigns, doesn't rule, with the consent of parliament and you know the people through parliament obviously just as any government in a parliamentary democracy springs out of parliament and it must have parliament's support so in conclusion to this, this argument that if the king has real power then that's illegitimate and if he hasn't got any power then he's just irrelevant and we can't have it both ways the rebuttal is that, well, it is a false choice. It's a false dichotomy. The king has real but very limited power. Uh, the right to be consulted, uh, the right to encourage, and the right to warn, as well as a limited number of important constitutional duties, 
all settled within law and convention, and therefore literally legitimate. But in addition, subject to the approval and consent of Parliament, a Parliament that is elected by the people, and therefore also democratically legitimate. Of course, a great many people chose to show up in their thousands and watch the procession, and queued for up to 24 hours just to catch a glimpse of the cloth that covers the box in which the Queen's body is lying. Naturally, I defend anybody's right to do this. If you want to grieve, then by all means grieve. I'm just asking you to understand that not everybody shares this compulsion, nor thinks it an event worthy of a national shutdown, non-stop rolling news coverage, and a bizarre taboo on having anything negative to say about the existence of hereditary monarchy in the 21st century, to the extent that its protesters are being arrested in the streets and to relatively little objection. Some of us, in fact, are quite insulted by the suggestion that God has elected some people as rulers and others as subjects, and that there's no amount of personal achievement that can alter one's category. Support this mythical state of affairs publicly if you choose, but please be aware of the elitist aristocratic principles you're thereby legitimizing, and why not everybody takes too kindly to them. I've thought for a long while now that it's high time that we did away with this surreal and mystifying element of our country's constitution. And now that the Queen is dead and Charles is taking her place, we've been met with a perfect opportunity to discuss its future or non-future in British politics. And if you want my view, I think the monarchy should have died when the Queen did. But if So here I want to draw your attention to a bit of a rhetorical trick. When he says, support this mythical state if you want to, sort of referring to the whole notion of the divine right of king and all that, which I dealt with earlier. But what he's, trying, what he's doing when he, when he does that is that he, he gives the impression, again, of this sort of false choice, really, between either believing in, in, in the myth of divine right of kings or agreeing with him, agreeing with Alice, as if no other alternatives can exist. Now, we know that's not true. So let's focus on his next point. He says that by showing your support for the constitutional monarchy, you need to be aware, if you're not, that you are legitimizing the principle of aristocracy and elitism, as he calls it. Well, uh, I mean, it's true, indeed, as I said in, in, in a previous section, that our support for the monarchy, the people's support for the monarchy, does give it dem democratic legitimacy. Uh, in addition, of course, to the, to the sort of literal, actual legal legitimacy that it has in the law and and by convention. So, so you know, I'm glad Alex is acknowledging that point. But the essential argument that by supporting monarchy, we are automatically also supporting the principle of aristocracy and elitism, he is again employing an empty meme, if you remember what that was. An empty meme is an argument with one or more premises unstated. So what are the unstated premises here? Well, I can only see it as one, monarchy equals aristocracy and elitism. And two, that aristocracy and elitism are bad things. So are those, are those premises true? Well, let's look at some of the most egalitarian, i.e. least elitist countries in the world. Uh, such as the Netherlands, Denmark, Norway, Sweden. These are all monarchies. Um, and, and actually, Norway, my own home, home country, or, well, native country, I live in England now, in Norway, they actually did away with that kingdom's aristocracy in the 1814 constitution, in which they also restated Norway's status as a hereditary but limited constitutional monarchy. Now, contrast these, these kind of Scandinavian countries and Benelux countries to some of the world's most prominent republics, not least France and the USA, and you actually find countries there with pronounced levels of elitism. So it's perfectly possible to support a constitutional monarchy without supporting uh, the principle of elitism and aristocracy. Uh, you know, elitism is very much present also in, in republics. So you might as well say that, well, if you support republicanism, you are supporting elitism. You know, um, just as just as logical, logical or illogical. And then to the unstated premise number two, that aristocracy and elitism are bad things. Well, I think it, it depends very much on the context. And Alex may actually agree with that when 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 he if he gets a chance to reply to this, which he is very welcome to do, by the way. Um, 
But but look at, for example, when when uh, Russia and France got rid of their aristocracy uh, in their two countries' respective revolutions. Well, it didn't have any immediate positive effects, right? So I think rather than thinking about it all in the abstract, you know, let's ask if the current presence of aristocracy in Britain actually hampers ordinary people's freedoms and ability to participate in the political process. Uh, you know, we have something like, what, 47 dukedoms left, six, perhaps 700 aristocratic families in total in a country of nearly 70 million people. In the House of Lords, uh, you know, after various reforms in the past few decades, only 89 of, the, of its 827 members are actually hereditary peers. So I think rather than talking about you know, the abstract principle. Let's ask specifically, what specific problems are these people causing for ordinary people's freedoms and participation in the political process? And I think the answer is none whatsoever. And therefore, well, supporting it or expressing something that is an abstract support of it, well, is that a problem really? really? Is that, I mean, is that an issue? It's not. Also, when it comes to elitism, you know, uh, I mean, who would oppose elitism in top sports, in classical music, in heart surgery? Sometimes elitism is good. Now, sometimes it might be bad, but hey, let's be specific. It's not helpful or instructive to, to simply talk in abstractions. Finally, please don't interpret what I'm saying as in any way hostile to the Queen personally. I'm constantly reminded when I raise my democratic concerns of what a wonderful woman she reportedly was, and how much she did to unify our country and engender unprecedented national spirit. It troubles me not at all to accept that she did these things, and did them well, but let's not pretend as if these are relevant qualifications in determining who should rule a nation. If providing national unity and community spirit, and just generally being a good person, are sufficient warrant for being the head of state, then we may as well declare Harry Kane or Gareth Southgate to be the King of England. It's nothing against them personally to suggest that, despite their achievements in this regard, heads of state in the 21st century ought to be elected by the people. The fact that the Queen was a unifying figure is not relevant? I would say it's very relevant for being the head of state. And the fact that she was not elected contributed to that. The very act of having any kind of election is, by its very nature, divisive. Look at the US, look at Hungary, look at France, all countries with elected heads of state, processes that have been massively divisive in those countries. And who can forget the greatest democratic exercise in this country for at least a generation, if not several, the Brexit referendum. Was there ever anything more divisive? And I should also mention that he keeps saying that uh, the, the, the Queen ruled... Uh, and yeah, well, you know why that's not true now, and uh, that's not correct. But uh, to not understand such a basic point I mean really weakens your credibility when you put forward an argument against uh, a constitutional monarchy. Alex then concludes with a wholly unsupported claim, namely that heads of state ought to be elected by the people. Ought to? Well, why? Um, again, Anthemium, he doesn't give uh, the re the really fundamental reason for that claim. Uh, the premise that he builds that on. Um, I mean, what about Germany, for example? So in Germany, the president is elected by a federal convention that mirrors the composition of the Bundestag, which is the German parliament. And what about Israel? Uh, in Israel, the president is elected by an absolute majority in the Knesset, the, the Israeli parliament. Now, these heads of state are not directly elected by the people, but put in by a process of indirect parliamentary democracy. And although we, as the Scandinavian countries and the Benelux countries, do not employ uh, a process of voting, but instead employ the hereditary principle, you know, the monarch is still constituted by the consent and approval of parliament. In other words, it is an indirect democratic process under the rule of law. And I should point out that we have heard no argument from Alex throughout his monologue as to why the hereditary principle is either wrong or that it doesn't work or perhaps combination of both or some other reason. I don't know. You know, he just hasn't, he just asserted it, but he hasn't given us a fundamental uh, a reason as to why that is so. I would submit that the, the hereditary principle is neither worse nor better than any other system. 
But again, it depends on the context. It depends on the specifics. Has Alex, for example, not heard of the British philosopher Michael Young, who in 1958 actually coined the term meritocracy, and he meant it as a negative term in his dystopian satire, The Rise of the Meritocracy. And more recently, another Michael, this time the American philosopher Michael Sandel, who in his 2021 book, Tyranny of Merit, What's Become of the Common Good, says of meritocracy, and I, I quote, the more we think of ourselves as self-made, and self-sufficient, the harder it is to learn gratitude and humility. And without these sentiments, it's hard to care for the common good. End of quote. So I put to you that rather than having a head of state who believes he deserves to be there, you know, imagine a, a President Blair or, or indeed Boris, or how about the Lord Protector Nigel Farage? Now that's the thought for you. I think it's actually a good thing that the current king uh, Charles III literally has done nothing to deserve to be in that position he finds himself in, other than to behave in accordance with his constitutional role. This inspires in him humility, gratitude, and as we saw with his uh, late mother, the late uh, Queen Elizabeth II, a deep sense, a deep commitment to fulfilling one's duty to the country and to the people, all of the people not just those who voted for him, because nobody did. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is a good thing. I hope this podcast has been useful. I certainly learned a lot preparing for it, so I, I hope you learned something too. Alex O'Connor is a great podcaster with lots of interesting guests and conversations. Really recommend you to, to uh, check him out a bit more if you haven't. And so I hope he doesn't mind that I perhaps rather cheekily used his monologue to construct an oppositional case against uh, but, you know, he has done actually similar things to others, so, so I'm sure it's fine. And Alex, you have full right of reply if, if, you, should, if you should ever hear of this. Uh, you know, you can, you can look up one of four London debaters and get in touch or perhaps write an email to info at londondebaters.club. That's info at 104 londondebaters.club. Now, let me leave you with a quote from the great philosopher, pol politician, from the 18th century, Edmund Burke, from his famous Reflections on the Revolution in France from 1790, in which he says, and I quote, The science of government being therefore so practical in itself and intended for such practical purposes, a matter which requires experience and even more experience than any person can gain in his whole life, however sagacious and observing he may be, it is with infinite caution that any man ought to venture upon pulling down an edifice that has, which has answered in any tolerable degree for ages the common purpose of society. End of quote. And end of podcast. You've been listening to The Debating Toastcast. Feel free to leave a comment, critical or encouraging. We welcome both. And if you'd like more information about joining the club or coming first as a guest, please have a look at our website, 104londondebaters.club or send us an email on info at 104londondebaters.club That's info at 104londondebaters.club Thank you for listening. <laughs>